gentlemen, Jeff Jones with us tonight. A winnable district. I know, I know what the media has told you about Michigan Congressional District 12, that it is the dingle seat. It is the royal seat uh, of patronage uh, that we should bow in the presence of Debbie Dingle. Uh, but the Marxists don't understand. America has changed. And there is a wave coming, a red wave coming uh, in November. And Jeff Jones, who is running for office in the 12th Congressional District against Debbie Dingell, could actually change the outcome of many uh, elections around the country. I want to introduce to some, present to others, Mr. Jeff Jones, uh, pastor extraordinaire and a complete servant leader uh, in its own right. Uh, Jeff, let's get to the basics here. You are running in a Marxist territory, Congressional District 12, Michigan. There is absolutely no hope. Uh, the UAW is all going to turn for Debbie Dingell. Uh, all of the Democrats will come out in force and they're going to vote against you. They're sending money to Debbie Dingell. There is no chance of victory. Can you tell and rebuttal while, why I am wrong? Yeah, certainly. Um, again, you know, the GOP, I should have, I guess everybody looks at the district, you know, as a bucket with, you know, 87 holes in it. So they don't want to put no water in it. Uh, but there's been a lot of legwork that's been going on for the last six years, and this is my third run against Debbie Dingell. I am the first Republican to to just scratch the 100,000 vote mark uh, in a 70-30 district. That means that pro possibly 40,000 uh, Democrats and Independent are, have already swung over to my side, and that's just historical. So, um, but a couple of good things are, you know, we we got all the data, and our data says that we need 150 to 160,000 votes. To win this, um, a couple of the good things, and you know, back in 2016, I was two points ahead the entire day. The polls closed, and about two hours after the po polls closed, miraculously, 80,000 votes showed up from Ann Arbor, Michigan. No one knows where they came from, and no one's got time to fight them or the money to fight. You know, the uh, uh, the disintegrity, the lack of integrity, you know, in that structure. But anyways, this year in Ann Arbor, there's 30,000 uh, students that aren't are at, back at home voting with mom and dad. The campus is closed. And so those are 30,000 votes that Debbie Dingell's not going to get. So that takes our number down to about 20 to 30,000 votes that we need. And we believe that there's at least a 20 percent Trump swing, you know, in that in that realm, let alone um, the Arab uh, American commu uh, conservative coalition has engaged with me and and they you know they they represent a strong group of Lebanese and uh, diversity in Dearborn we think that they're going to probably pull another 10,000 possible votes our way maybe more and then with our leg work but interestingly enough we just started this uh, yesterday and we have 12 digital videos running uh, from basically from 6 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night um, the, the view ratio of those 12 in the 12th district is a million views a day till November 3rd. And so this is brand new. No one's ever done it. Um, we had the opportunity to jump on it. Uh, we really think that that there could be, you know, even 20 or 30,000 more. So we feel at this point uh, that we're ahead of the game. I mean, we're, yeah. we're already breaking over that 50-50 mark. And so... Well, there, you know, there's a couple things we'd like to do, but we're certainly thankful for where we're at and those that have made the commitment. And they made the commitment to me. And, and, and I don't take that lightly because um, it's been a long battle. I mean, not only am I fighting the disparity of a 70-30 a district swinging uphill, but even and there's been people that have spent a million plus dollars in the district that um, uh, that didn't get any more than you know 60 you know uh, yeah. 60 percent or 60,000 votes and so dollar for dollar for what I've spent um, I did that face to face and I find out that about 98 percent of the people that I knock on the doors and I don't 
strategically only knock on Republican doors. I'm not afraid of what I believe and what I stand for. I happen to believe that the Constitution unites us and that voice in itself to the right people agree with me. There's still the Reagan Democrats out there, especially downriver. Um, data shows that my number one voter are Teamsters, number two voters are truck our pickup truck drivers, and my number three voters are executive women. So those three blocks alone make up a very powerful um, uh, dialogue and, and communication manifold uh, that we're excited about. We think that this is the year uh, to make the dents. Jeff, uh, there are people who are sitting at home, and they are floored. They are awed. You went out, and you invited uh, the UAW, the Teamsters, to come on board, and many of them are Reagan Democrats. And what exactly did you say to them that intrigued them? Because Debbie Dingell holds, you know, the unions hostage uh, in terms of support for victory. Well, you know, Debbie's been there for three, you know, three terms now, uh, so six years. So six years is enough to show that um, that everything that she said is a lie and the things that she does is just another backbite against those that have supported that campaign for 87 years. Um, I'm, I'm bold enough to come out and talk about, and there's a lot of people that love John Dingell. He fed a lot of people spaghetti and, and shot a lot of duck, uh, you know, on the lake, <laughs> yes, in the river. Uh, so, uh, but I, I'm willing to talk about the issues, get in the trenches. It, I've been in a lot of places and people don't understand um, what the ministry does. I mean, I'm, I, 724, I engage with people at the worst of times, the most struggling of times. They open up to me about, you know, their, uh, the most intimate details of their, of their struggles. And I find that depression and anxiety and um, drug abuse and, and uh, uh, um, domestic violence is just r raging. And then we find out that the opioid addictions are crazy. And, and then we find then we make these connections because it's really the same issues. I was in Detroit in 68. And I remember, even though I was young, I remember what the, I didn't remember, I don't, I didn't engage at a political point at seven years old. Yeah. But what I do remember was that the community was beat up. It was depressed. They were, the, there was corruption. There was dishonesty. And when those things exist, and 87 years is long enough to talk about it and trail it and show the people that the things that they say are not accurate and the things that they do are are not the way they want the way they make the presentation, especially like the UAW. And, man, I could go on and on about just exactly. addressing the topics. And I, and I just want to – This I is wanna, my community. Exactly. Jeff, that's the key. This is where you live. This is where you breathe. This is where you work. These are your people. Uh, and you know – what they say behind closed doors and what they say in public, and you know what they go through. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you about, uh, once again, about the UAW, Joe Biden had the opportunity to visit uh, one of the car manufacturers uh, in his trip to Michigan. And he literally called one of the UAW members a liar when it came to his opinion on the Second Amendment. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have made it a point that they will go after the guns of Americans as soon as they put their hand down off the Bible and swearing in on the oath. Where are you on the Second Amendment and where are the people of your congressional district? Well, again, there's a lot, a lot of deer hunters here in Michigan, and a lot of, a lot of people that are sports enthusiasts. But Debbie Dingell, I just got through with this, uh, this debate with her, and I, had, I brought it out without calling her out, but boy, she jumped on it right away. See, she had said in an open interview on, and I think it was Fox News. It could have been a local WXYZ radio station or something. But anyways, she said that if she could do away with the due process laws, she could mm. accomplish a lot more. So to, what she's saying is she's willing to charge people and make them guilty before uh, they ever have the opportunity to say anything about it. And then the lawyers jumped in on that because, and they want to fund it because, oh my goodness, the litigation of making someone guilty take, 
having a, a red flag law that takes takes a vet's guns away. I mean, I just give you this scenario. So here's a guy. He does a couple of tours in you know Iraq. He's home now and he's missing his legs, and things are getting rough. He's got a family and so forth, and he's feeling like, man, I'm not all that I want to be, and I'm struggling with this, right? Mm -hmm. So his wife says, you know, she's always irritable. She finally convinces the, him to go see his doc. He goes over to the VA, and the VA doctor says, this is going to take a little bit of edge off your life. You know, it's, the, it's not that big of a deal, but we're going to give you this little psychotropic drug, and it's going to help you with your PTSD or whatever else the case may be, right? Yes. And so now because he's taken that drug, he's labeled as a red flag and says, oh, my goodness, he could be dangerous. So I would love to see Debbie Dingle and a state trooper, which who wouldn't join her, or the local police walk on someone's step in the uh, on the on their porch in the 12th district and say, you know, I'm sorry, Mr. Veteran, but we're going to take your guns away because you take some Wellbutrin. And man, I would be there with everybody that I know in that neighborhood if I knew that was coming down and stand in that driveway and not let anybody enter in because that is a violation of his constitutional right to defend his family because he has nothing, no charges against him, no problems. He just needs to take an edge off of living, and he's got, that shouldn't happen. Our forefathers made this decision. They purposely put the Second Amendment where it was to preface the Third Amendment, and a lot of people forget about that. It's strategically placed. We know, okay, it's the Second Amendment. Obviously, it becomes yeah. between the First and the Third, but the First Amendment was so valuable, they said we need to defend that, and then the third one, which was seizure of property, yes. they had just had their current government walk into their town, kick the people out of their house, take over their home, take their cows, their chickens, their horse, maybe their wife and children, burn their house down, and then leave them behind homeless, and said, the forefathers said, that will never, ever happen again, ever, on U.S. soil. We're going to put the Second Amendment that these rights shall not be infringed upon, and it belongs there, and we need to defend it. But for 50 years, Congress has been playing footsie with it. You know, that's my position. Th on there, there is a question, <laughs> and I love it because here's the next question: Are you open to Congress passing a national carry law? Well, yeah, I, I think that we should have a, a an open carry law for just. I mean, we have it here in Michigan, and yes. I know it's not everywhere. So, um, because it's open carry law, even sometimes the Capitol opens up, and yeah, people will walk in with their AR-15s now. People got to realize this: an AR-15 does not mean it's an automatic weapon. You know, there's yeah. other rules about some of that kind of stuff that already taken place years before, years ago. So, but either way, um, you know, we we shouldn't hide behind that. And again, um, it's not about a, a, a wild open west. It's it's about accountability, responsibility. And if they knew that there were responsible um, gun control uh, uh, gun owner advocates that knew how to we. We used to offer this in public school. We ought to offer it again, uh, you know, yep. offer that type of training. And so, you know, if we were walking around and I, you know, I have my CPL and, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't like to walk around with a 40 caliber Smith and Wesson everywhere, yeah. but, you know, I, but at the same time, uh, I, I wouldn't mind a nice P365 Sig Sauer in my pocket at all times. So. <laughs> I want to ask you. Because you are also pro-military, pro-vet. Uh, I, I can tell that from your work with uh, Community United, you work with a number of individuals in the community who have great yeah. needs. Um, but here's a question for you regarding your difference with Debbie Dingle. And I want to make this uh, pertinent clear. Debbie Dingle is pro-Black Lives Matter. Uh, the organization itself uh, may be different from the aspirations of the individual followers, some of which are concerned about police brutality. But to endorse Black Lives Matter is to endorse three things. Marxism, number two, the eradication of the family, and number three, the outlet outage of the black man from the home. I want to get your opinion regarding Black Lives Matter, your thoughts, and as well, your thoughts on police brutality. Well, you know, I think it goes without saying, you know, that, that Black Lives Matter, my goodness, that would be moronic to not say so. Uh, I do believe that there is a social injustice imbalance 
you know, probably systemic in some ways as well. Uh, again, like I said, I grew up in the riots of 68. I remember them well. And I remember the things that brought uh, that, that whole ugliness about. You know, Jimi Hendrix said it best, when the power of love finally overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. Generally, it's not about equality. Um, it's about supremacy. And so, you know, Black Lives Matter just changed their uh, their mission statement about a week ago that yeah. said who they were, that they were, it didn't mean, they said they are against the black man and the black, uh, the ba black mom with two kids, you know, in suburbia. That's, the, they feel that that's part of their enemy. And so they changed their mission statement to cover that up. But, you know, Debbie Dingle will, will get on her knee for uh, defund the police. But she just, again, lied in the last, the last, uh, um, you know, forum debate that I had with her. Um, she's all oh, I know not about defund the police. She has voted time and time again in Dearborn, probably the most hottest spot of mm -hmm. racial potential uh, disparities. And the police officers have asked for contemporary riot gear or um, the capabilities of, of handling a terrorist break. And she's denied it and denied it and denied it and denied. She does not want to fund that effort. And again, that's an attack of our of our safety in our communities, and I think there's more Americans. And again, even in Dearborn, for the people that I talk to, there's more people in Dearborn that came to America because of the tyranny that existed in the Middle East, rather than that came here to to you know to to start some terrorist activity, you know, in you know in our communities. Yeah. And so these are part of the the obstacles, the struggles, the lie um, that unfortunately the organization BLM you know, uh, promotes um, or covers up and their links that Antifa is not a terrorist activity and not, they don't even, you know, Joe Biden, I, I don't know what terrorism is, you know, whatever. Yeah, you, you yeah. wouldn't because you've been racist all your life. I mean, <laughs> and I hate that, I hate that term, you know, but again, you know, you know, he's just been very blatant about what his thoughts and ideas are. And to me, I mean, I cut my teeth in ministry in Cabrini Green, Ken. Yeah. I mean, so... I was I was there in the Nation of Islam, uh, telling after people had been uh, in Lake County and Cook County prisons, and I was sent to the families to talk to them uh, about decisions that were made inside the prison. I mean, I was in the heartbeat of it, and 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 so um, I was accepted in community not because of uh, not because of my color, but because of my genuine my genuine idealism towards humanity. That yes, that. If we can't love our neighbor like ourselves, you know, it, it just ain't worth bearing the label. And so, you know, churches have failed with that. It's the easiest thing most remembered, and it's the thing that, as a whole, um, the American Christian church has failed at, and that's loving our neighbor like ourself. Oh, my God. We ran over time, and, and I, I know that you've been at a debate, and you got uh, such a hectic schedule. We're going to have you come back, but I, I got to ask you this question. Um, for uh, those who are listening tonight, President Trump's administration and the Environmental Protection Agency has been off criticized for handling the water situation in Michigan. Uh, if you would, okay, because you are closer to that than I ever will be, what has this administration done to help Michigan and to help the people? Uh, in the communities that are affected by the decisions made by city planners uh, in Michigan regarding the water that's being used. Well, let me preface that answer with just a little bit of data that a lot of people don't know. Debbie Dingell, for six years, has served on a committee in Washington. It seems fairly, uh, you know, just a small little thing, but what her, what her committee does is to know the value of water in the United States. So before the Flint water crisis ever took place, whether she knew what she was seeing, that information about the Flint River came across her desk and could have interrupted those those decisions long before the damages were done. Let alone that when you when you uh, when you clean up a, a, a lake like Lake Erie or the Detroit River, it's going to make the water clear. What's going to happen with that is you're going to get an algae response out of just natural sunshine shining in the water, not caused by, by farmer runoff and yep. attacking those areas, let, let alone that the PFAS thing that she goes crazy about, 
was all caused by Pfizer and the University of Michigan Research Laboratories that have been dumping that have been dumping soap, you know, into the into down their drains, into groundwaters, and into our rivers and streams, causing all the problems. So she'd been well aware of its source, well aware of it for a long time, and um, I believe that um, the current administration has dumped more money into parks, wrecks, our our you know, and our feed lines, uh, our water supply, which is so valuable to Michigan. I mean, we make up such a major, major, you know, part yeah. of natural fresh waters and it needs to be protected. And we, and we need to understand uh, that good things are happening and that um, the Dingle family has been just doing nothing but covering it up for 87 years. You while, know, it's, while, it, while steel plants were dumping in the Detroit River. Exactly. It's so easy for the left and for, and let me just say this, this is not you, but there are many African American individuals who are around the country who are easily swayed by a narrative and not the truth. Truth right. perseveres no matter what. At the bottom line, this administration has done a wonderful job trying to improve decisions made at the local level in Flint, Michigan regarding water. What would you do in these final moments, sir? What, are for, what is your agenda for the people of Dearborn uh, in the Michigan Congressional District 12? Well, no, certainly, again, I use three things as my standing points. We need to preserve our Constitution. We need to support our community. And we need to protect the heritage that, that made this a great nation. And that may seem simplistic, but it roots into everything. When I address especially the 12th District as a whole, one of the number one uh, air pollution and water pollution problems we have is a power plant um, located in Dearborn, Michigan. Um, there's a, and those that live in that area uh, are well aware of the problem, and they've been given a speed pass because part of that play, the place where Debbie Dingle is in Washington, gives money to EPA and the DEQ, and they're dumping tons and tons of tons of of of, of ammonia and other things into our air, literally by the tons, um, and um, but that's her. That's the company that owns that power plant is one of her number one uh, financial mm. suppliers. So the problem is lobbyist dollars talk. And it's about the time that someone goes to Washington who's not bought by lobbyist dollars that lives a life. I have 11 children and 17 grandkids, uh, 16 and 17 in the oven. But this is my neighborhood. This is my community. And we've lived it. And, and, it, and, and it's been nothing but decaying. Uh, and the, the the jobs are decaying, the opportunities are decaying. That's all because of the leadership that has mishandled or double dipped uh, in the 12th district. And I need to take a stand against that. I, I I sleep at night with the passion. Pastor Jeff Jones with us tonight. Uh, he is running in the Michigan Congressional District 12. You can find him at Jeff Jones for Congress at Jeff Jones for Congress. I'm just letting you all know, ladies and gentlemen, TECN TV is committed to bringing you urban conservatives who have opportunities of winning their district. But our races are not local, and many of these individuals are not connected with the K Street uh, pimps called lobbyists. <laughs> so they don't have access to the Capitol to run against the million dollar machines like Debbie Dingle and Benny Thompson uh, and so on. So I would encourage you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my strength, number one, just go and become a friend on Facebook or Twitter or wherever that person is. Become a friend uh, and, and then if you could donate 5 or $10, we're not talking about a million dollars. We know you don't have it, COVID. But if you could donate 5 or $10 to these particular candidates, even if 100 of you were able to do that, that adds a sizable portion to what they already have. And in addition to that, I'm quite certain that Pastor Jones needs your prayers. How can people get in contact with go. you, sir? The best way is um, if you go to Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash Jeff Jones, the number four Congress. That's what we use to get the word out. PayPal's there. Um, I, uh, you know, our, our, our committee name is Vote Jeff Jones Committee, uh, lo located at 10400 Holland Road, Taylor, Michigan, 48180. So any way you want to participate, um, there's certainly great things that can be done. 
and we are most thankful uh, at, at everybody's level to participate with us to help preserve our constitution, you know, help help build our communities, and help restore the heritage that made America, that has made America, and kept America great. Pastor Jones, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We'll be God bless you. Well, hopefully, you'll be back with us in a couple of weeks. Uh, thank you, Pastor Jeff Jones, with us, ladies and gentlemen. Victory is closer than you know, and as well closer than you believe sometimes. I'm telling you, he is just tens of thousands of votes. I'm talking about 20,000 votes away from upsetting Debbie Dingell. You're not going to hear from the Cook Political Report. You're not going to hear from Politico. No, no, because they don't want something to change. But the people of Flint, Dearborn, and other areas of Michigan are tired of the okie doke. They want something new and they have bought into our constitution, liberty, freedom, capitalism, uh, and as well, a man who has spent years preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Grade him by what he's done, not by the narrative that the left presents. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back with more of the best in Urban Journal Talk right after this.